Hi guys, this is Isaac. I'm going to be doing the Economics Masterclass, uh, going through paper, sorry, let me just get to the front page of the paper. October, November 2014, paper code 970, 9708-11. Uh, I'll just apologise quickly, I'm recording this from an airport terminal, on a quiet spot, but my flight's been delayed, so I thought I'd record one of these sessions now. Um, however, just bear in mind there might be a little bit of background noise, I'll try and be as clear as possible, and if there's a particularly loud announcement, I might uh, pause. I've run a few tests and it seems like the sound quality is fine and that you can make out my voice. Um, I'm speaking very close to the microphone, so when you do listen to this, you might need to turn it down a little bit. Just bear that in mind. OK, so looking at question one, let's move through the questions again. As I've said many times before, I'm going to go through each of the questions, kind of give you the answer, and then I will um, kind of highlight some of the key issues, some key points that might be involved in answering this question before allowing you to kind of uh, ask any questions you might want on the, on the Slack and get answers or bring it up in a live session yourself. So first question here is what are involved in the allocation of resources in a market economy? And here it's very clear that the resource allocation mechanism is the price mechanism. So price is factor. Uh, if we look through the answers, we don't really have any prices mentioned. And then here we're talking choices. So consumers choosing to supply relative to demand something relative to the price set and producers choosing to supply relative to the price set. So it's here that prices and the choices individuals make or firms make based on those prices will determine the allocation of resources in a market economy. Moving on to question two. Here we have a curve, JK. And JK in the diagram is a PPEC, a production possibility curve, showing the production uh, of two goods based on full capacity being uh, used in the economy, so every economic resource being used. Here we can see that point M is just inside the PPC, so it's not on the PPC, it's not productively efficient. There are spare resources, kind of slack resource in the economy, and then we've got N uh, points on the inside of that. Uh, so that's another kind of position where more slack, there's more economic resources not being used or less economic resources being used. It's kind of like unemployment or spare capacity. So we're looking for something that's going to increase that. And it's very clear that when you look at the options, question uh, answer D, an increase in the unemployment rate is what is ultimately driving this movement. The only thing that can explain this. Question three. In the 20th century, we have the nature of a typical car assembly plant being changed. The key information here is going to be in this line where I'm highlighting. Uh, we've got fewer firms. They operate on larger sites and they have more automated machinery. So we're going to see an increased relative use of land and capital. We see they operate on larger sites. They're going to use more land. They use more automated machinery. They're going to use more capital. However, there's fewer firms. So we assume there's going to be less businesses, enterprises, and also less labor. They're going to employ less people, partly because of fewer firms in the industry, and also partly because they're using more automated machinery, which relies less on uh, workers to operate. There's kind of a... Oh, that was not supposed to happen. That's quite a simple kind of answer to, to that question there. Let's just check that I'm sharing the screen here. That should be. Yeah, I'm sharing the screen. All good. It just wasn't kind of flashing up normally. I get a, a notice saying that I'm doing that. Okay, question four. What is meant by the value of money? Here we can see the answer is clearly A. Uh, the amount of goods that can be purchased. When you have £10 in your pocket, that £10 is worth as much as the £10 that, could, that bit of paper can kind of purchase or be exchanged for. Uh, the amount of wealth stored in the form of money would kind of determine maybe the value of money overall in the economy, but not, not the value of the money itself. Uh, the cost of production of money, it's the cost of money, nothing to do with value. An opportunity cost of holding wealth in the form of money, again, is a cost, cost of money, not to do with its value. Um, the reason that money holds its value is simply you can exchange things. If people cease to accept money in shops, for example, or people demanded more money for certain goods, then it would just, uh, the value of money as a, uh, would go down. It's kind of what we think about when we look at inflation. Uh, question five is what might shift an individual's demand curve for petrol to the right? So we know that demand for petrol is increasing. And in fact, people tend to think about it, tend to demand petrol not for petrol consumption itself, but for its use in other uh, cars or machines, etc. So what can either drive demand for petrol is an increase in demand for petrol in itself or an increase in demand for a good that uses petrol, which then drives an increase in demand for petrol. Normally, it's the latter case. And here we see a fall in the price of cars, which is likely to stimulate demand for cars, is then going to stimulate demand for petrol, increasing it and shifting it to the right. So although the, the price of petrol hasn't necessarily changed to drive the change in demand, 
a fall in the price of cars has changed the demand for petrol because we need petrol to power our cars. Question six. Here we have a diagram showing the consumer short run and long run demand curve, in this case for coconuts. And we're looking for kind of, I'll just zoom out the question quickly so you can, you can see it properly. Um, here. So the question asks is the price of coconuts increases from P. We know that the consumer short run response is greater than its long run response, meaning it's going to be more elastic, uh, i.e. flatter. Uh, so it's likely to be this curve, x, y, if we go above. And if we go down, p to zero, we know that it decreases, it goes below p. We know the short run response is smaller than its long response, therefore the short run response is like deeper at uh, this point, y, w. So we've got this kind of weird where it looks like it's that there, when it's above, but it looks like it's that little curve there. So what we have actually here is a cute demand curve. We have a point at which above the price p, there's a different reaction, different steepness of the demand curve, and above p, we've got a different steepness short run demand curve x to y. So we know actually that the demand curve is going to be x, y, w. But this isn't a typical demand curve shape. We normally encounter straight lines or perhaps a little curve. Here we've just got a kink. So at this point, p acts as the pivot point or the kink point there around which the different steepnesses of the demand curve pivot. All right, question seven. Question seven shows the demand curve for products. Um, uh, question seven shows the demand curve for a product here. Uh, if you have the rectangle here, O, um, L, O to L, N to N there, and we also know that that's equal in area to this rectangle, R, Q, P, O. Those two are equal. We know that there must be what's the rule, but the rule is that we have unitary elasticity of this demand curve. What does unitary elasticity mean? Well, unitary elasticity means that uh, you've got a same proportion fall if you have a price rise from here in O to R in this case, or uh, to O to N, so that little increase there on that increase there results in equal shift out from O to L to O to P in quantity. So we know that there's a proportion, there's got to be a proportion, so the answer is A. It's this notion of unitary elasticity that we're kind of hammering home here. Uh, question eight, uh, which elasticity value indicates the cars are normal goods? So what is a normal good? Well, it's one when it's, it's um, when the income's increased, demand for it increases, as we expect, hence they're called normal goods. Um, so we're looking for a positive income elasticity of demand there. They move in the same direction. And if petrol is a complement, then we know that its cross-price elasticity of petrol relative to changes in car prices is going to be negative. It's going to have a negative cross-price elasticity. As price for one goes up, demand for the other goes down because demand is likely to move in the same direction. So we're looking for a negative XCD and a positive YD to the answer C. That's just relying on simple definitions of uh, elasticities and you knowing what different elasticities denote in terms of types of goods. Sorry, scrolled a little bit too much there. Uh, question nine. Question nine here is showing a specific tax being placed upon a bottle of perfume salt. In the diagram, we have uh, this initial supply curve, SS, and we know that after the tax, it shifts to this supply curve, ST, ST. So what do we know about that? Well, the size of the tax is the vertical distance between these two supply curves, so it's shifted. Um, it's this kind of W to, to T point there. And we're looking for the revenue so that we know that the size of the tax is WT, or RP in this case here, PR. And we also know that it depends on the quantity sold, and what's the quantity sold, but it's O to Y here. So we know that it's going to be this area here, the size of the tax times by the quantity is government revenue. And it's this rectangle, RWTP. Or in this case, they're going PRWT. So just finding that area based on the areas of tax. But there's quite a few people walking past. So just Take a second. Okay, question 10. When demand for a good increases, the equilibrium price the same. What's the good's elasticity of the pie? It's kind of a tricky question. It's a little bit sneaky event, but it's in here. We know that demand's increasing. If the equilibrium price has to stay the same, then we know that supply has to react in a similar way. And the good's elasticity of the pie is infinite. It means they can respond to any change in demand. We know that they can match the supply. So it has to be infinite. If there's an infinite increase in demand for the good and the equilibrium price staying the same, then the good's elasticity of supply also has to be infinite. So the elasticity there is infinite. Bit of a strange question. Um, pretty tricky, worth just kind of learning, the un getting an understanding of what it means when uh, differences shifts and stay at equilibrium price and how that plays out to elasticity, kind of very key relationships that would emerge in questions in the first part of this, this paper in particular. Okay, in question 11. 
here we have a manufacturer with an estimate, has, where a manufacturer has estimated that the price of elasticity of supply of ice cream is plus 1.5. Uh, so depending on which way price goes, we're going to see supply move the positive way by, one, by a unit factor of 1.5. We have to times whatever the increased percentage is by 1.5. Here we know that price has increased by 10%. Uh, so we're going to have to times 10% by 1.5. We know that that's 15%. Therefore, the manufacturer will supply to the market an increase in supply of 15%. Again, a quite simple question relying on the understanding of price elasticity supply equations and just applying the maths, the maths there. Okay, question 12, moving nice, nice and quickly through this paper. Again, this actually paper I find is quite straightforward, and you'll see there's a couple of tricky questions at the end, but for the whole, should be fairly manageable for you guys. Here we have question 12, where consumer X is the largest of these five consumers and buys 50% of sales. Bear in mind this 50% of sales is going to be crucial. It means that consumer X represents half the market. Table showing the quantity of good demand from consumer X. We know that because consumer X represents 50% of sales, that the overall demand of the market is going to be double whatever consumer X is demanding. So here at all of those consumer X is demanding 20, we know that overall the market is demanding 40. So what we're looking for is we're looking for a market equilibrium price. We're looking for a point where double this figure, double the consumer X demand is equal to the market supply. At $6, we can see here that doubling that is 32. So total market demand is 32. And here market supply is 32, therefore that's equilibrium. Equilibrium price is $6. Nice, easy question there. Question 13, just bear in mind at 15, I'm going to take a break. So this recording will be split in two. Um, question 13, here we have a difference between what consumers pay for a product and what they are prepared to pay is known as simple definition, consumer surplus. Um, remember, producer surplus would be the difference produ uh, producers will be willing to supply a product for and the price they actually supply it for. Here we've got the actual price and what consumers are willing to pay. It's just consumer surplus. Again, learn those definitions. These should be easy marks. They kind of need to be at the tips of your fingers, those definitions. They're what the beginning of this paper is based on. Uh, here we have question 14, a question on types of externalities. Here, question uh, point one is a firm creating an extra supply of trained labor. One, we know that it's a firm creating supply. It's a uh, production externality. Here, we like the fact that it's trained labor. That's positive. So we know one is going to be a positive production externality. So it's one of these two. Excessive noise made by a household cutting is one here. This is complicated, though you may think that household cutting sword is kind of like supplying, he's engaging in productive activity. Here he's actually consuming something. He's consuming the opportunity, in a sense, to use his lawnmower and cut his lawn, and he's making excessive noise. The fact that it's excessive means it's a negative externality. So we could kind of eliminate the fact that we know it's going to be negative, so we're looking at positive and a negative there, not a positive positive, so we know it's going to be C, but it's a consumption externality because of that fact that he's kind of consuming an opportunity. Bit of a strange notion to get your head around, but something to kind of to really just bear in mind when you're seeing questions like that. Finally, question 15. I'm just going to take a break to get a to get a bottle of water so I can actually speak to you in a clear voice. And maintain that. Question 15. Here we have the table showing that the total amount consumers are willing to pay for different goods quantities of good X, total external benefits that arise from consumption of X. Here we're basically looking for marginal social benefit when you're consuming 5,000 units. So what's the total external benefit? Well, it's 80. Uh, 80,000. <clears> we know they're getting kind of, so we're looking for total marginal social benefit. Let's remember the consumer's willingness to pay uh, aspects here and also the total external benefits. So we know here external benefits are a factor of 12,000. So 68 to 80 is 12,000 plus the 280 to 300 is 20. So those two add up together 32,000. Therefore, marginal social benefit here is this kind of uh, 32,000 when we move up to 5,000 units sold. Again, quite an easy definition relying on your understanding that marginal social benefit is going to include both the consumer's payment side of social benefit uh, that's the primary, and the external benefits. Remember, social benefits include both private and external benefits there. Um, I'm just going to take a break now. I'll finish this aspect of the recording and get back to you with the uh, later 15 questions uh, in a separate piece. Um, thanks.